Christian Wilkins. <laughs> yes. The Dolphins could have franchised him, tagged him for twenty-two million. Mm -hmm. Another team gave him twenty-seven and a half. I'm sitting there thinking, why not just tag him for the one year? What are some of the things that I should know? What are some of the things that fans should know about why you all didn't just tag him for the one year? Well, there's a you know there's a compounding variables in that, and you know I've been first to say you know I. I absolutely love Christian Wilkins as a player and his game. Um, but there's this whole thing about the salary cap. And and when um, money goes in one place, it doesn't go another. And our job is to facilitate the best team. And, you know, unfortunately, this is, this is a process that, you know, it, it's not easy. But, you know, you're, you're looking at it from a reflective standpoint successful organizations encounter this all the time where you have homegrown talent your job is to maximize what they are as a player and then you have problem solving situations year in year out that changes the complex complexion of your team and the bottom line was um, we we've never doubted Christian as a player um, but you have to make some tough decisions uh, when you're thinking the whole scope of the uh, of the team, and really, realistically, like it's a lot more difficult than uh, than we want all of the the best players, um, and so the, there's there's times like that it, when you have good players on your team, something that you're hoping to a, a, a problem derived from drafting a good player and developing them. Um, is that it, there's we've made a multitude of moves um, that you know with, with our relationship towards the salary gap probably wouldn't have existed with that so it's you know that's part of the business that you know from my vantage point as the head coach you either want um, to be able to uh, you know retain every player that you have or you want to see them Okay, have a, uh, a, a, a grassy meadow of opportunity to go um, fulfill their dreams elsewhere. So I think uh, that that's something that is, you know, for the fan and me, I can totally understand. But, you know, Chris and I have to think about the uh, whole complexion of the team and, uh, and the opportunity costs with every player that we do so. No, I think I think there you learn lessons in everything you do. Um, I'm, I'm very, like I said, I, I think um, from a head coaching standpoint, I'm very proud of um, you know those two guys individually. Uh, and I think we were. Um, it wasn't like it just jumped on our radar. These are things that we were we've been discussing. We were um, in contract talks with uh, Christian last year. Um, and, and we, you know, we we had an offer that we thought was very fair, and Kristen chose to bet on himself. And in those situations, I think the 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 best result um, is the team gets a player that's highly motivated that that earns the contract that he gets. Um, and you you have to be you, you can't. You have to keep the, the scope of the entire team and the competitiveness that you can put forth at every position. Um, and those, those situations are, um, may arise that way. Uh, I don't think anything from those two uh, players, that, that whole process is uh, necessarily going to affect the processes of players moving forward. Every individual is different. Um, I, th I think, one thing that I did take away was the best case scenario um, for for our organization is that if um, there's a, a more lucrative scenario that they they want to chase outside of the team, you know both uh, both players 
um, with, with Christian and with Rob were, it, it wasn't like it was easy for them to leave. The relationships um, that they were leaving, the, the emotion that they had in the building um, on a day that's celebratory for most, um, I think that's what I want to stay connected to is those, it's relationships above all else and transparency and, and sometimes when business doesn't work out, that doesn't mean relationships have to be fractured. So I think I was very proud with, um, you know, on every level, our communication through the process and, you know, it, it all comes back to the fact that there's a finite salary cap, you know. And sometimes we have to, we can't be the kids spending the money, we have to be the parents that have to look at our budget and make sure we can pay the water bill. You know, I think it was, um, I'm very, very proud of the orchestration, um, particularly between the coaching staff and the personnel department. There, it, it was not, um, let, let's not uh, let's not fake the funk and act like it was a easy problem to solve. Um, that's a still still an on, we're always solving the 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 problem of roster and trying to make it better. But I saw create it an orchestration of um, multiple people on all fronts being very communicative. I think we found. Um, really, really good players that really want to play um, for the Miami Dolphins organization. And we were able to really cover, um, you know, we had, a, we ha had a lot of holes to fill. And I think um, that doesn't mean we don't really look at it as a, okay, at the end of free agency um, or, you know, free agency is still ongoing, but, you know, at a, in the middle of March or the third week of March, our roster is complete. That's never the case. Um, you know, we still have, there'll probably be some free agent activity before it's all said and done um, before the draft. And then there'll be the draft that will add pieces. And then there'll be after the draft where, where some movement occurs. So um, there, I think the, the problems were challenging on the front end. Um, no one wavered. We really, uh, we really resourced all of the brain power within the building. I think um, I'm, I'm very fired up about the individuals that have come in the building uh, since the league year started and that are um, all about pushing us forward into 2024 because we have, a, uh, we have exciting things to do and um, big goals to accomplish. Make sure it's all at the same time. So uh, things were great with him. Um, you know, we, we did make him an offer, and business takes time, um, especially uh, with, with players that, um, you know, such as Odell, who's had a phenomenal career, still has um, really good football in front of him and has options. So um, that, you know, there's, there's not... I think those conversations will be um, ongoing. We'll see where they go. Um, I'm not, I, I don't live in the world of crystal balling, and I do stay in my lane as a coach. I'm definitely ready to coach him if, he's, uh, if, he's, if we can come to agreement, and I think both sides are trying to work towards that. We'll see what happens. Hey, Mike, uh, Jordan Poyer, you faced him in the division for a couple years. What was intriguing about bringing him into the, into the team? You know, it's classic, can't beat him, join him. No, um... I think, I think that that's a, he's a really, really cool player that, you know, I actually have experience with from um, my year in Cleveland in 2014. And I think uh, one of the most exciting things about his addition is his, you know, he, he has an attachment to the, to the city of Miami. He, he wants to see goals that we have as a team accomplished. And he's, you know, to, you should, to hear him have conversations um, with Javon Holland and, you know, uh, just exuberance about um, both players taking their game to, to another level, uh, that gets you excited. I think that's good, really good news for the Miami Dolphins organization because 
at the, at the end of the day, you want guys um, who are fully invested, that are excited and energetic towards towards the goal and going to come in the building every day and work. And I know that's what he's going to do. And um, I know players on the team are excited to have him. Yeah, I've thought about it uh, long and hard, um, and uh, you know, I think the one of the things that um, we we've done this off season is uh, really leaned into the facilitation of um, full communication and development of, of our staffs on uh, in all three phases. Um, I think from play calling um, perspective, you know, for now. Uh, in, in the spring, I'm going to call plays, and I plan doing it in the fall. Um, but we'll always um, adjust uh, if necessary. But as long as you're okay with me calling plays, I'll call plays. I'll oh. right, uh, a question on a different topic. Uh, Tyreek has had some off-field, I guess, headlines um, recently. Have you guys talked to him about that? And how have those talks gone? No, ab ab absolutely. The, I, I think... Um, you know, all things um, with regard to to um, players on our team, it's of paramount importance that you have communication. One, one of the things from our perspective is I think it's very important as an organization that we're in the, um, we're in the avenue of finding, gathering, and um, learning all information possible. I think that's kind of our obligation to to all parties involved, to to have information, and I th one of the um, one of the th good things about uh, this off season, in in regards to Tyreek Hill, is um, our communication with him um, has has been phenomenal. Uh, you know, working through different things um, is is part of the coach player relationship. Um, you, you don't wish unfortunate things. On anyone, um, but our but our number one obligation to both player and the organization is to find out all the all the information possible, and then to work with the player. Um, and in in Tyreek's case, we've been very transparent. Uh, he's he's been very candid with us, um, and uh, we're we're working uh, with him on all the all those things. Hey Mike, what kind of player is uh, in person is Jerome Baker? What type of what type of player in person is Jerome Baker? Um, you know, it, he he was a really cool um, player in, in in the last two years for me because he's an incredibly smart human being that gives you some of his really dynamic personality. You know, when when he feels comfortable and you've earned it, and so seeing how his teammates were around him and then as you know the first season went on and I earned more and more of his trust and him giving me a, you know his personality and and being vulnerable to me like um, he's a guy I can I can understand why all of his teammates that he's ever played with absolutely love him and you, you talk about a guy that um, is extremely extremely smart and can handle a lot of things. I've, I've firsthand witnessed him, um, you know, be the uh, be the commu the main communicator in, you know, basically three different versions of defense. So, um, wonderful human being. Can't say enough good things about Jerome Baker, and excited for his opportunity in Seattle. Mike, this is kind of a kind of broad question, but is, is there one Kyle Shanahan story you have that you kind of carry with you that, that you think has made you a better coach? Or Yeah, um, I'm not sure if it's happenstance. I was asked, I was answering another question uh, maybe yesterday um, in regards to him. But the first thing from from my perspective, uh, you know, he, he was such a, a big part of my career from the onset. You know, he was the first person that told me that um, it doesn't matter what I look like or or – who I am, if I can help players um, accomplish their goals, players will listen to me. Um, 
moving forward all the way to 2016, something that, that jumps off um, for me in terms of shaping my understanding of my current job as a head coach. 2016 with the Atlanta Falcons, he was the offensive coordinator and play caller, and there was a third and two in the Super Bowl um, against New England. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know about it. Uh, Atlanta didn't win. Um, I didn't, did I just break this? Sorry, I didn't want to ruin the ending for you guys. Yeah, I gotta get that. Um, but I think it was 28 to, I don't know, 12 or a teen digit. And it was a third and two. And um, because of injury during the game, we had a, uh, a shuffle in the backfield. And I, I, I watched him call a play that was designed for Aldrick Robinson, um, uh, guessing a certain coverage, and put in the play based upon guesses of what the defense might show that they haven't. Bottom line was it was the third quarter of the biggest game of our lives and he made a perfect play call because we had some injuries during the game. Um, we had, our, our protection was a little off and we got sacked. So I watched him um, be fully prepared, do everything in his control, make a play call that was highly scrutinized. And you kind of understand that, for me, that brings me peace in my job um, to, to like, not over, you only can do what you can control. Um, you're always responsible for the results. And, um, you know, to me, I, I learned so much about how to, how in high stakes situations, um, it doesn't matter sometimes how much you prepare, how, how well orchestrated, um, a, a, a scheme is or everything that you can control from a coach's perspective football is a team sport and a lot of things are going on and sometimes it doesn't fall your way and you have to move on and and do your best moving forward so um i hope that answers your yeah, question definitely. thanks mike, 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 I'm, mike I'm, sure, I'm sure you would like you're to the add. closest to me yeah. i'm sure there are a lot of players you'd still like to add if you could but Given what you've already added and what you might want to add moving forward, if you could fill one more position with an impact player, would it be number three receiver? Would it be on the defensive line, offensive line? What would that one player bring you? Wow, you're really trying to strong arm. Or that was a very well thought out <laughs> way to, to ask the question. Um, you know, I think... I think for me, and, and, and I, I, I share this vision um, with the coaching staff, you know, so often you can fall into the trap of spring, even summertime, uh, you know, you're, you're chasing that, that feeling of accomplishment of you're looking at the depth chart and looking at the roster and you want to plug piece of name that makes you feel good um, and it, it's not about magnets or depth charts it's about human beings and who's the best player so as long as we we have very capable football players at every position you're trying to position yourself where okay who's the best player at what they do and let's let's evolve around them how I talk about skill position players in general at this stage, um, where we're at with our roster, that's that's the kind of approach that we look at the rosters. Who who's the best player, and we'll adjust by position. You know, if you're if you're super fired up about um, a a third receiver, whether that's free agency or the draft, um, and you know, then you evolve into more three receiver sets. You know, and then. If, if there's a, if you have an opportunity at another run stopper, um, you're able to work more on two shell defense because you can you can stop stop the run with you know you kind of evolve to where your opportunities are. That's where you kind of have to stay at 
at this point where you, you have you have to be very calculated um, with your free agent acquisitions, and then you have to make decisions um, not based upon necessarily position as much as team impact um, with your draft picks. So it's not intention. I'm not intentionally trying to be gray. It's gray in that way where you're okay. Well, this player, he's good at this, and if we get this player, we can't have this player. Which version of the team is the best? Um, which is why it's a uh, e exhausting process, and why Chris Greer just grinds me to to a nub. Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike. <coughs> um, yeah, I would love to. They. They have been doing phenomenal. Um, those two in particular. You remember that line that I was talking to you guys about all season with, with Jalen Ramsey about um, no timelines? So after action report, since you guys didn't want to bring it up, I think that worked well. No timelines. He came back faster than you guys thought. But it's also from a psychological standpoint, you don't want people to chase the wrong things. I bring Jalen Ramsey up because both of those two individuals, Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips, are extreme versions of, hey, we need to make sure they're not chasing a timeline because as competitors, they will just they will achieve that timeline. It might be at the worst for their body. So the, relative to timelines, we specifically don't, don't have those for those two. We've had to, to mandate that they have a week off of um, rehab just recently, both of them, because they've literally, they live there. Um, they, they have a uh, pseudo um, tape on the floor parking spots for their little scooters that they've graduated from. And they're, they're, they're both uh, really hitting, doing exactly what you'd expect from those two individuals which is um, absolutely attacking that process, but um, doing it from a perspective of, you know, they, they don't want to get healthy for one week. They want to be healthy for the, for the whole season. So that's what they work towards. Hmm? You know, I think, um, you know, I, uh, with, with intentionality, you know, I, I try to, I try to keep myself as head of coaching and, um, and you know, the contracts and contract negotiations, those things, um, take time. You know, I, I do expect to, it to be in OTAs only because, um, you know, my working relationship with, with Tua. And for two years, I've watched um, Tua um, gain some unbelievable residuals towards the, the season um, in that process. It's part of the reason um, Tua is who he is, is because he's always learning, never staying the same, and always working on his craft. And I know, um, you know, the one thing that he likes to do um, now in his life, besides uh, be a kick-ass dad to Ace and Maisie is play football with his teammates. So um, th that's what I expect. I don't put really too much thought beyond that. Um, I understand the business, but I also understand uh, my job with Tua is to make sure that his football is continuing to evolve and the best days are in front of him, which uh, are both of our goals. Mike, because, of some of the because of some of the roster deletions, some of the expectations, Las Vegas odds makers, NFL analysts, have been lowered for the Miami Dolphins in 2024. What are your thoughts on this idea that th this might need to be a reset year? Well, um, so you're <laughs> okay. You're talking to a guy that um, is very well versed in uh, in expectations or lack thereof, um, just in life. Uh, if I, if I really, 
it does surprise, you know, I don't know if, I don't really attach any emotion to it. Um, that, I can tell you one thing, um, every single player that was on the team last year and the team and the year before, and every single player that we've added this off season and every single coach that we've added this off season, um, their expectations are to help fulfill um, goals un unaccomplished. And the, yeah, there's been zero time um, spent thinking uh, anything less bold or less aggressive than the way we approach every season. Um, the, to trivialize a season or to say, um, you know, I, for me, I have a hard time expressing what our team's going to be like as the head coach without ever being around the team. Um, I think everybody's individual expectations are extremely high. Um, the more people lower their expectations, um, the, it's kind of erroneous or irrelevant. Um, but I know that uh, starting April 15th, guys are very, very hungry to deliver on what they know, which is um, an opportunity to be on a team that uh, has the ability to grow from what we've learned last year and what we've went through and have zero thought as to um, down, rebuilding, wh uh, whatever those words are. Um, that makes zero sense to me. We're going to have um, fans are going to pay to try to uh, watch us play football and people don't go to games to watch people lose, you know, um, and people's careers. This will be the most important year of every single player's career because it's the only one that exists. And uh, we, we've talked about that at length before. How would you describe the impact Robert Hunt made on your offense last year? Um, oh, he had a big he's, – he's been a big part of, um, you know, what, what we've been doing on the offensive line um, since, since it got here in 2022. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a guy that um, – really has has grown and become a professional football player um, from the day we walked in the door uh, and I think he's he's a guy that um, is a tremendous asset for the for the Panthers and what they're trying to do and happy that he uh, he was able to um, you know really hit that milestone of that contract for him in his career and uh, that, that's something that again if if we were priced out because guys have really grown um, uh, within the organization, that's a good thing for the organization. It's a good thing for Robert, and I'm happy for him. Mike, how odd, how odd or different is it going to be coaching in the, in the division without Bill Belichick? Um, it's it's going to be interesting. Well, um, yeah, it's bizarre. It's bizarre for me. Um, I think I was in high school the last time he was in a coach in the AFC East. So uh, from a competitive standpoint, uh, you, you want to go against the best. Um, I have no doubt that um, you know the New England Patriots are retooling in, in their own fashion um, to be their best selves. But in terms of an individual to go against, um, there's not anybody more difficult um, from a defensive standpoint to try to to try to forecast what they're going to do in that next game, and um, there's not anybody better at facilitating technique and fundamentals across the board. Um, so to say that uh, I'm, you know, somber and have been mourning the loss of Bill Belichick in the AFC East would be a flat-out lie, and I wouldn't lie to you.